Hi, and welcome to my OCRA A-Level Biology Revision session with me, Christine. So today's lesson, I want to look at batch and continuous fermentation. So let's just take our step back and remind ourselves about the population growth curve of bacteria in a closed culture. Now, you should remember that it always follows the same path in that you will have your lag phase, your log phase, your stationary phase, and the death phase. And if you haven't already done so, do check out my video on culturing microorganisms. So this is our population growth curve. And we know that there are some limiting factors which can limit the rate of growth of these microorganisms. Well, what we are interested in here is what's known as biotechnology. This is where we're going to be applying biological organisms such as fungi, yeast. These are eukaryotic organisms and bacteria, prokaryotic organisms, we're going to be applying these biological organisms or their enzymes that they produce to synthesize, break down, or for the transformation of materials in the service of people. So our population growth curve is at the moment in the exponential log phase. Well, we are going to get to a point where we hit stationary phase and then potentially lead on to death phase. Unless we find a way of ensuring we can continually produce these materials which are in service of us. So what do we do and why do we use these microorganisms? Well, because we know that we can take the number of cells of these microorganisms that have a very short life cycle and have this rapid growth rate, if we're talking about prokaryotic organisms, we know that they can reproduce and double every 20 to 30 minutes. We know they've got a rapid growth rate, so we can utilize that. The nutrients that they require are often very simple and also relatively cheap. And because of that, that makes them good organisms to use for this service of people. And the other thing is that they can be genetically manipulated. So obviously check out the, my videos on manipulating genomes, but the fact that we can take the plasmid of a bacterial cell and insert a gene like the human insulin gene means that we can actually produce very vital materials in the service of people because we can genetically manipulate these microorganisms. Now, it is important that we note how to calculate the growth of the individual organism. So you should be able to use the formula for the number of individual of organisms. So N equals N0 times 2 to the power of N. So capital N is talking about the final number of organisms. N0 is that initial number of organisms. N is the number of generations. And two signifies the fact that each organism is going to double the population size. So if we have an example like this, we have optimum conditions. We have a bacterium and it's going to divide once every 30 minutes. We start with 30 minutes. We have a single cell as our N0. And then we know that it is going to continue for six hours. So how many generations are we going to have after? after six hours. Well, we know that there are two 30 minutes in an hour, so therefore six hours times two will give us 12 generations. So then we just plug those numbers in. We had a single cell. We know that we times that by two to the power of ge generations, which is 12, and that will give us that we should have 4,096 cells after six hours. So we can use this to calculate what our number of cells are. Now, if we understand that each of those cells is going to be doing metabolic processes, we should really think about our concentration of substrate. So if I give, for example, my cells a nutrient broth which has glucose in it, I should expect the glucose to drop down because glucose is used as the respiratory substrate in glycolysis. Well, what's going to happen to that glucose is that glucose is going to be broken down and that will result in a new molecule, molecule being 
made. Now that molecule, for example, is called a primary metabolite. This primary metabolite that we are going to be using, for example, may be pyruvate. So a primary metabolite is a substance formed as an essential part of the normal functioning of the microorganism. So as they do glycolysis, they're going to break the glucose down to produce pyruvate. That pyruvate is a primary metabolite because it's an essential part of the normal functioning. Now that pyruvate could be used to carry on through the link reaction and then the Krebs cycle and then oxidative phosphorylation and we could end up with ATP. So this could be a primary metabolite. We could end up with lots of coenzymes, amino acids, carbohydrates, lipids, or nucleotides. So we can grow these microorganisms because we might want to actually use their primary metabolites. What we may do is actually, we want to utilize something that they produce, which is not a primary metabolite like antibiotic, it's classed as a secondary metabolite. It's not essential for their normal growth, but is used by the cell. So the secondary metabolites may be a molecule that's produced, for example, antibiotics to kill off any of the competitors around them, which may be using the nutrients that they require. So it's not an essential part of the normal functioning, but it is a or organic molecule that is produced to be used by the cell. So antibiotics could be an example. Now these ones are normally formed during the stationary phase. So the primary metabolite is produced during the active growth of the microorganisms, whereas the secondary metabolites tend to be produced when you get to that stationary phase. Now remember, in that population growth curve, the stationary phase is when the number of cell deaths is equal to the number of cells dividing. So the fact that they are equaling means that they are starting to compete for resources. So therefore, these secondary metabolites are needed and necessary for continuing that growth. So I'm going to take you now to a completely different avenue and talk about a sourdough starter. So if you've ever tried to make a sourdough starter, what you'll do is you'll take a container, you'll stick some yeast, some flour and water in this container and then you will leave it in a area to ferment. Well, what's happening is the yeast is going to be using the flour the polysaccharides in the flour and it is going to be hydrolyzing them down into glucose and aerobically respiring. Once all the oxygen has disappeared, what you're going to then get is anaerobic respiration occurring. So if we understand that we've got aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration happening, what we end up with our container is alcoholic fermentation. So this is where they could interlink your subject areas together in, for example, paper three. So we have our sourdough starter and we have this decarboxylation happening, the removal of carbon dioxide. That is what the bubbles are. So if you see the bubbles, that is carbon dioxide that's being produced through aerobic respiration if we're talking about the link reaction and we're talking about the Krebs cycle or if we're talking anaerobic respiration this is when it occurs with the pyruvate being converted into ethanol and then the ethanol will be converted into ethanol. Well when we bake the bread that ethanol will evaporate off so that won't be present. So what is it about sourdough starters that makes the bread so different in texture and taste compared to normal bread. Well, what you actually find is there's also lactic acid bacteria naturally found in flour. So what they will do is they will hydrolyze down the substrate glucose and they will produce lactic acid, a primary metabolite. Now, this combination is going to add flavor and texture to the bread. So what we've done is we've taken a microorganism, we have given it some nutrients, we've put it in a container and we've allowed it to 
ferment so that we can then remove some of the material to make bread to give texture and flavour to our bread. Well, industrially, we can do the same thing, but the first way, a bit like my sourdough starter, is called batch fermentation. So instead of it being in a container, the microorganisms are inoculated in fixed volume of medium in what's known as a bioreactor. So this is the first thing you have to know. We're going to batch ferment. We are basically going to put nutrients, microorganisms in a bioreactor and we're going to allow them to grow. Now during the stationary phase, those microorganisms are going to carry out those biochemical changes to produce these secondary metabolites, the desired products that we're interested in antibiotics potentially or enzymes or it could be insulin if we were looking at a genetically engineered prokaryote. So during that stationary phase they are going to be producing these secondary metabolites. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to stop them before they reach death phase. So the process, this batch fermentation process is going to be stopped before death phase and those products are going to be harvested. What I mean is they are the products that we want. We want to remove them and we want to then use them in whichever way we're going to do. So with my sourdough starter, what I do is I remove a small amount of the starter and put that into my dough that I'm going to make bread with. And that allows for me harvesting those secondary metabolites, the lactic acid, which is going to give it a more creamier texture. Now, obviously, it's a batch fermentation. I'm doing it in batches. So therefore, just like with my sourdough starter, if I were to do this again, I need to sterilize my system, put the ingredients in again, and repeat the process. So with batch fermentation, this is the same process, but done in a much bigger bioreactor, but it's exactly the same thing. We're taking the microorganisms, we're inoculating them in a fixed volume of a nutrient medium in this aseptic container, the bioreactor, and allowing it to grow up to that stationary phase. And so therefore we have to keep an eye on that population growth. We have to keep an eye on some of the conditions, i.e. what's happening to the pH within the environment. Because if we allow the pH to change too much, that could result in death phase. So we want to stop it before it gets to death phase. So that's one way in which we can industrially grow microorganisms. The second way that you need to know is what's known as continuous fermentation. So continuous fermentation is where, again, these microorganisms are inoculated in a sterile nutrient medium and they start to grow. So asepsis has occurred. We have a bioreactor which is sealed. It is an aseptic unit. We are then going to provide nutrient medium continually this time because it's not batch, it's continuous fermentation. We are continually adding once it reaches that exponential growth. That nutrient medium is continually being added once we've got to that exponential growth. And then what we're going to do is we need to make sure that those nutrients are evenly distributed as well as heat. So therefore we do a mix mixing within the bioreactor. So they tend to have a paddle which will turn around to ensure this even distribution. Now that culture broth is continuously going to also be removed. So we are continually adding nutrients and we are continually removing some of the culture broth. And the reason we do that is we want to ensure that this volume remains constant because if the volume gets too big, we could get to the point where we have reached our death phase. We do not want to do that. So therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to harvest the products and we're going to do what's known as downstream processing, where we're going to take the useful parts of the mixture and separate them out. But it's important to note that when we're doing continuous fermentation, 
We need to be aware of what's going on and therefore we need removal of waste. Remember carbon dioxide will react with water to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid will then dissociate to release hydrogen ions. Those hydrogen ions will affect the pH. So this is where it interlinks with your content that you learnt in the transport of animals topic area. So don't be caught out in thinking that that will only be assessed in paper one. Paper three brings all of it together and is application skills. The other thing we need to know as well is when any type of reactions are occurring, heat is going to be generated and therefore released. So the temperature within the bioreactor is going to change and therefore that is going to affect the rates of the reaction. So they have a cold water cooling system because that is bringing in your water molecule knowledge in the fact that we know that water has a high specific heat capacity and we also know that water can then remove that heat if we are circulating it round. So the cold water is going to be circulated in what's known as a coat or a jacket that surrounds the bioreactor and what happens is that cold water when it comes in contact with the heat that's being generated within the bioreactor that thermal energy will then be transferred to the cold water by conduction by convection by radiation and therefore that can help to remove that heat energy from the system so I hope you've liked this video and if you have then please do click on the like button and also subscribe to my channel. And if you haven't already done so, do check out my revision platform www.aiqchat.com.